The, the problem that the Disney leadership has is they don't understand. They say, we want subscriptions and we want people to buy crap and we want them to get toys and buy video games and books and all stuff. The reason why we sign up for Disney Plus and the reason why we go to movie theaters and put our butts in seats and pay prices, the reason why we buy figures and video games and comic books and novels and dishware and towel sets and whatever is because there's a good story that got us interested in that in the first place so that we would buy all of that stuff. And yes, they're a publicly traded company, and yes, they are facing some serious financial issues, and it has to do with enterprise-wide failure, not just the mishandling of Star Wars. It has to do with getting into the culture war and getting into political fights with various state leaders and all of the other things that they're doing and all the parents that they're making mad with their content and all these things. Star Wars is a small part of that uh, in the larger part portfolio of Disney, but the the everybody's walking away from all of this stuff and it has to do with the stories, but they're like, well, we got to just get clicks and we got to get people signed up. So let's make another show and they make another show and it's bad batch or they make another show and it's resistance or it's the vision show or whatever. And it's just, it's junk or it's not as good as it could be. It's not as well thought out and, and people are spending more time on the spectacle than the story. And, the spectacle only works for a little bit, but eventually you have to tell a story that is meaningful to people and resonates with them and sticks with them enough for them to go down to the store and buy whatever it is you're putting in front of them. Well, is the Mandalorian with Grogu that rare case where you can appeal to the normies? And if you want to make as much money as possible, you should go in that direction? I don't think so. Well, the way season two ended going forward, I think that you have with the normies you've told a good story you've hooked everybody not only on grogu because everybody loves grogu right but the mandalorian is he's a favorite they're all invested in his story as well what is he going to do um how is he going to deal with basically giving up his child and going against the grain of how he was raised as an orthodox as you put it Mandalorian, right? Don't take me out of, but I've met all these other Mandalorians and they have different views on what it is to be Mandalorian. I think that a good story would have kept them all in it through a whole season three without Grogu. And then if you brought him back at the end or continued a story with him later on, that would have been fine. The conceit or the whatever you want to call it the, about normies and sweaties. Again, the sweaties. You know, they want the hundred, they want a, a clone of original Star Wars, right? They want something that doesn't deviate from that. Uh, and the normies don't know what Star Wars is, but they know what cute is, right? And so then you can go with that. But the good story with a bit of cute and with a bit of old school Star Wars gets everybody together. And the, the story about Dinjarin is. Uh, very compelling story and it's very interesting especially in the era in which we live um, if if you want to stand back it's it could be taken as a as a religious story his character and what his character is going through in the sense that not some kind of religion specifically or a religious belief but it's about how religions as a as a as a bureaucracy or as an orthodoxy, how they work and interact with one another. I mean, it's almost the, the Mandalorian diaspora after the great purge is almost a metaphor for the Protestant reformation. One group death watch who considers themselves the old school originals and they follow all the rules. And then you've got everybody else who's all these different groups who share the same core belief system, but they have different, different orthodoxies. That story uh, is also kind of a metaphor, in a way, for the polarization that we're dealing with in our society. You know, how do people who generally um, have similar core values or have more in common than they don't have in common, um, how do they navigate this us and them, if, you don't, if you're not with me, you're against me, 
Anakin Skywalker talk, right? Like Star Trek, and I would I, I keep bringing up Star Trek a lot in our, our recordings, and I apologize, it's a Star Wars podcast, but Star Trek originally used the the veil of sci-fi to address political issues and moral questions and wrestled with difficult things. But because it happened out there in space on a ship in fantasy land, nobody really paid attention to it in the sense that they didn't think it was real political commentary, even though they were getting real political commentary and it allowed them to discuss and talk about things. Right. And so the Mandalorian, the character of Din Djarin and the things he's going through, there's a lot of good story stuff in there. That's very relevant to our day to day lives. He's a single parent. He's an orphan. He's a guy who's, been raised a certain way in a certain religion he didn't realize that there was other ways to do that religion right and now he's being exposed to different orthodoxies and he's having these existential crises all over the place right and these are good stories that can resonate with an audience of sweaties or normies because at some level on some of these things we all have shared experiences with this main character whether it's about parenting or about children or about politics or religion or that that time I was asked to be king of Mandalore or whatever, right? Like we all have these experiences so we can resonate with this character and that's the good storytelling. And yeah, you throw in the little cute guy who throws up on himself, right? And all the girls are like, oh my God, he's so cute. You know, and then you've got all the guys like, yeah, Mando's going to cut a dude in half at the door again, right? And like, and everybody's there, right? The sweaties are like, oh my God, there's stormtroopers at Star Wars. And the normies are like, well, it's such a great story about this guy and how he overcame adversity, right? It's all there for everybody, but it's all based on the good story. Again, we talked about the spectacle versus the story. You can put all the Star Destroyers and Death Stars and all that stuff in a movie, and it's going to be garbage, and it's going to be called The Rise of Skywalker because there's no story there. And then you can take something like Andor, which has very little star wars in it in in the sense of what people think of star wars right lightsabers and jedi and stuff like that and you can tell a really really good story about a character and people get into it and and depending on who you talk to it's the best star wars since star wars right so um the sweaties and the normies can come together a lot and a lot more often i think than people give them credit for um making sense within your universe right whatever your theoretical universes that you're working in, whether it's Star Wars or the Marvel universe or whatever, right? Being true to your characters as best you can, understanding the limits of the media that you're pre presenting them in, just telling a good story. And that's why people, a lot of people who didn't care about comic books and didn't care about superheroes went and saw those Marvel films multiple times each. And we're talking like 20 films over 10 years or 12 years or whatever. And Again, something that's missing in the Star Wars universe is that, first of all, that type of planning and that attention to detail and that reverence for the, the material. Uh, but when they do get it right, everybody loves it. The I think we've talked a lot about the lessons that Disney learns and doesn't learn and how they misinterpret the results. I think that they look at Mando and they say, well, just give me more Mando, right? Just give me more sidekick story adventures and babysitting and we're gonna make a billion dollars and it's like well, yeah you you did but now we want to see where that goes right we want to see how do these characters develop how do they change what what's the next adversity that they have to deal with right you can't just keep giving me baby yoda bouncing around the cockpit of a ship throwing up on himself that gets really old really quick what's on the horizon for the Mandalorian in terms of toys and anything from season three that we didn't see in the trailer or, or wasn't explicit. Well, on the, on the toy front, nothing's been revealed by Hasbro uh, since Disney took over. Um, they've been very quiet and that was very um, apparent in the first season of Mandalorian when baby Yoda was revealed huge surprise but at christmas time other than uh, maybe a couple of plushies and some calendars and candlesticks there wasn't really anything out there for kids to buy and play with on christmas day uh, because disney decides 
to Psy Dead, and they did this with the sequel trilogy as well, Force Awakens, um, that they kept everything a secret. You know, when episode one came out, and we all went out in April before uh, the movie and the toy release, and we all stood in line at Toys R Us at midnight waiting to buy our, our new action figures, there was this really cool looking one called Darth Maul. And we didn't know anything about him. Um, we know who he was, but he had a double bladed lightsaber and he was the most awesome looking thing I'd ever seen. And it didn't ruin anything about the movie for me. In fact, it made it more exciting for me to want to go watch the movie, if anything else. And Disney, their relationship with Hasbro is a little different. They keep everything a secret. They will let them know a little bit later on. To build stuff, but right right now there's nothing for episode or for season three for Mandalorian uh, that Hasbro has announced or has released. Um, so by the time they get that, everybody knows that it's 18 months from concept to conception. It's 18 months for a figure from them. And this is a, a big problem that modern Disney Star Wars has is that they don't they don't put anything out before or anything significant before the show anymore. And the problem with that is because of the, the way that they're trying to create buzz and hype and the, the thing that they're into there where it's like, okay, this show ended. Now you have a couple of weeks and the next show starts and you have a couple of weeks and the next show starts and then we're into the next year. Right. And so the show ends and you get all the toys but then they've released a new show that you're supposed to be watching and interested in. Right. And so you're like, oh, okay, well I got to watch the new show. And then there's nothing for the new show until it's over. And they don't go back and revisit anything. And this is, is this is, this blows my mind because if anyone who's you know, got half a brain at Hasbro who can go back and look at the historical information about their star Wars brand sales, if you look at the era uh, when there was no Star Wars media being produced and they were still putting out full waves of action figures and they were selling like crazy and they were things like third alien behind the fourth bartender at Moss Eisley. He was on screen for you know one tenth of a second and had no lines, but we got a figure for that particular character. And they sold and everybody bought them. The collectors were all into it. And the fans of maybe a particular film bought them because they were in the film or whatever. The shows as they come out here in the new Disney era, you get a few figures after the fact, maybe the main characters, uh, or unless they're pushing something and they feel you know really passionate about it as a company, they'll give you the full line of like the Bad Batch characters in Black Series. But you don't get anything else. Jared and I have talked about like the Andor show. The Andor's over. And we are just now able to order the Black Series figures and the um, vintage collection figures and whatever else. Uh, you can get... They've, they've got the, the Hasbro exclusive set of... Andor and the and the red droid, and that's about it. But it's all pre-order stuff. Well, the show's over, and now we're ramping up. We're just about to hit season three of Mando here, and by the time those toys hit, everybody's going to be in the throes of watching Mando season three. And we're all going to be talking about Mandos and Mandalorians and and the siege of Mandalore and all the stuff. And we're going to have no Mando figures, but we're also not going to be paying attention to the Andor figures that come out. Then we'll say, oh, well, season two of Andor is coming out. Okay, great. Maybe then before season two of Andor comes out, you give me a whole run of figures of the second tier characters from season one to kind of get me going. And maybe you can throw me a new costume or whatever on Andor or maybe Deirdre or whatever as a re, you know, a preseason release. And then you have stuff in the pipeline for later as the show's airing or after the show but this waiting way after the fact for product for a show that's now over 
Um, if you're really trying to capitalize on the market and really get money from the current buzz for a thing, you have to be doing this simultaneously while you are developing your show. Uh, so it all hits at the same time. Now, this excuse about it's going to get spoiled, it's going to get spoiled, people are going to, you know, it. nothing got spoiled when we were getting full runs of like 20 action figures before a movie coming out. All you got to do is give the vague character description on the back, right? This person is a Jedi. This person is an Imperial, right? And they're real bad or they're real good or whatever, right? That's the kind of stuff we would get on the back of the action figures. Didn't give you any plot points. Didn't, you know, the only thing, and, and we've also joked about this and talked about it. Everybody is worried about spoiling stuff. Well, they used to release the entire novelization of a film a month before the movie was released and you could read the entire story before you went to the, to the movie theater. Nobody was talking about spoiling, right? Nobody, you know, nobody cared. The Marvel star Wars comic for a new hope was a six issue retelling of the film. The first four issues were released before the movie came out. Right. so, between the comic book and the novel that came out before the movie came out, like people could have known what was going on in the film. Did it ruin it? No. Most successful film of all time up to that point. We get same thing with the sequels or sorry, the prequels. But suddenly now Disney's in this weird thing where it's like, they want to hold everything back. I don't know if it's because they're afraid. Like, are, are they afraid that if they put figures out, they're not going to make money or, that Hasbro might lose money and then they'll kill like the one last toy company in the world or whatever. I don't know, but it just doesn't really make any sense because if you are going to release multiple properties a year on your streaming service and we're not going to have any films, right? So the only thing we have for star Wars now is streaming service. And you're going to do three shows a year, like two cartoons and a live action or two live action, and a cartoon or whatever, but you're going to be doing this pretty much every year going forward you should be putting out figures and you should be putting out more than just the three main characters six months after the show's over, right? You got to be putting out stuff beforehand. You got to be putting out stuff during and after and make all the characters. I don't understand why Hasbro and Disney are so afraid of creating these figures for these side characters, because most of the time, especially in modern Disney Star Wars, the side characters are way more interesting than the main characters. And these are the things that we want to collect as collectors or we get into as fans. Like I need more Babu Frick figures in my life. Right. And we don't have any, I want to see that. Right. But we didn't really get it. If Disney put out or a, a box set of the band, the street band, the marching band from Andor and sold it at Disney parks, I'd be going to Disneyland to buy that. Like, I think that is, that would be a really cool thing. But people, and I can't be the only one, right? I can't be the only Star Wars fan who's like, I love the band. I want, to, I want, I want a box set of the band, right? I want a box set of the of the the mine workers in that town, you know. And I want, like, I want all those characters because I got all those characters from all the other movies and shows in the past. We we got everything except the Tonica sisters. Why can't we keep doing this? But I, I don't know if it's they think that people's attention spans are too short or they don't trust it or they're afraid they're going to lose money on it. But when you put out a bona fide hit like season one of Mando or Andor, you should be milking the hell out of that. You should be putting figures like flood the market figures, everything. You're telling them you have to care about my show and you have to watch my show. So in order for them to care about your show and watch your show, you want them to put down the other thing so they can pay attention to the new thing. And so you're you're hamstringing your ability to make money off the previous thing because you're telling them, no, forget about that. I need you over here right now. And so when they do finally put something out on the market, the fans are like, oh yeah, that was last month or whatever. I'm, I'm more worried about something else. And then it's this negative feedback loop. They put out a toy. It doesn't sell. You're like, well, the fans don't want toys, I guess. So we just won't do any. And it's like, no, we you just, you're doing it wrong. That's all. You just do it better. The, the business genius of George Lucas, um, other than him creating Star Wars, was the toys, was asking for the rights to the toys. And he understood it. And that's where he made a majority of his money. So my question to Disney would be, when you bought Star Wars from George Lucas and you paid billions of dollars for it, 
yes, if you release a movie, it's going to make a lot of money, right? But his success came from the merchandising, all of it, everything under the sun that you could stamp a Star Wars logo on. So how they missed the boat on this just baffles me. When they did the sequels and we didn't get a Luke Skywalker figure until the second movie came out. We didn't get a Jedi Master Luke. How is that a spoiler? You know that Luke Skywalker is going to be in these movies. You know he's probably going to be a Jedi Master. So you know, releasing him before the movie comes out is not a spoiler. Yet we didn't get him for almost a year and a half after that movie came out. Right? Force Awakens comes out. We see him for two seconds at the end of the movie. We get a figure a year and a half later. Makes no sense. Um, for Hasbro, who who are they selling to? You have a huge opportunity with the Mandalorian to sell to children to get a maybe another generation of kids interested in collecting Star Wars toys, buying them, world building all these toys and playing with them in their living room. But you don't release anything. You have nothing to release to them. Who are they selling to? I mean, is it just the adults out there? Is that who they're selling to? Do, have they just resigned themselves to, we're just going to keep selling ourselves to the sweaties out there, as Sean likes to say? I don't know. That's my question. I, I really would love to have an answer to that question as to what the business philosophy of Hasbro is and of Disney. Because I think that they have both missed the boat, miscalculated on everything up until now. And I don't know how they can recover and create a new generation of kids because the kid adults are not getting any younger and you're not replacing your client base with anybody new. It's um, better to get ahead and generate a little excitement than lose two to four to six months. Are they just, are they gun shy from the peg warmers of the sequel trilogy? They may be, but it, it's to the fault of Hasbro. They made some bad choices. At the beginning, they say that Disney didn't give them the information and they didn't give them access to characters who were coming up, but they were also really slow in the follow-up to do all of that. They overshot with the popularity and only sending out eight figures to a store. And instead of reloading with new figures, they just kept sending the same ones. Uh, to this day, you can still walk into some stores and see figures from the force awakens on pegs there. That's, that's how bad it was. The Disney direction of Hasbro is really kind of the core issue here. Um, I don't know how George Lucas's relationship with Hasbro went in the sense of telling them, put this many figures in a case. Like, I don't think he micromanaged them that to that level. He probably said, hey, this year I'd like to put out, you know, these 10 figures. You show me the mock-ups and the colors and all that stuff, and I'll tell you if they look good. I think that was more of his relationship with them. Um, Disney has got, got to the point where it's like, you have to make these figures, and you have to include this ratio of figures to a case, which produces peg warmers. Right? And that's why we we had the Ray problem, and we had... The Rose problem is because Disney, in it, in its infinite wisdom and pushing its agenda, said you must have multiples of these figures per case, and then only one of the others. Right? And then they're like, "Oh, but you know, the girls are going to buy it, or the people are going to buy it for their daughter, or whatever." And it turns out that no, the only people really buying toys were the adults. So you have these peg warmers, right? Well, it's this big death spiral at that point because the retailers have all of this unsold inventory and the retailers are not, they're not toy collectors and they're not sci-fi enthusiasts or whatever. Like for the most part, I mean, they're running a business and they're looking at units sold and they're looking at how much did we buy from this particular vendor? How much were we able to sell? How much is left over? How much are we going to have to clearance out and how much money are we going to lose on this transaction? Um, a lot of goodwill initially came up with The Force Awakens, right? There was, oh my God, it's Star Wars. It's the first Star Wars movie in a long time. We'll buy a million cases of your toys. And they did, and a lot of it sold, and everybody was happy. But then they started to get the peg warmers. And then they said, okay, well, we'll, we'll do the next movie, and we'll order a little less. 
And then they sold out of most of the stuff, but then they had the peg warmers. But there might have been more this time. And so then they say, well, the next movie we're going to order even less. And then we're going to get more peg warmers. And so eventually they just say, you know what? How about you just, we're not going to order anything. And that's the rise of Skywalker. And the company simultaneously is like, well, they're ordering less. So we're going to make less or we're going to develop less because we still want to sell a case. We got to maybe come up with eight figures, but instead of having multiple waves like they did with the first film, multiple waves of 15 characters for you ultimately line of like 48 total figures or something like that. And you get six or four, two to a case. It's, it's this self-fulfilling prophecy. It starts out with somebody making a diktat that is not in alignment with the market. And then the market saying that's not in alignment and then having them double down on it. And the market's like, we're really not cool with that. And then ultimately all the businesses involved are losing their on it. And then you get the massive collapse of the, of the toy industry uh, sometime after the force awakens, which killed toys R us um, almost bankrupt Hasbro. Uh, and then, has radically altered, you know, the way in which Hasbro's doing its business because it's trying to survive, but still Disney's hitting them over the head with make more of this and sell more of that. And they're like, we're not, we can't do this anymore. The the retailers are ordering less because now Star Wars is no longer a safe bet. Walmart is only ordering about 60% of the Star Wars stuff that they ordered a couple of years ago and it keeps going down. Nobody's taking the risk on the product. The product isn't good. The product isn't abundant. And and then the only people who are buying it are the collectors anyway. And so now the collectors are fighting amongst each other. So what is being produced is being sold for the most part. But if it's only going to be collectors, you can't be putting multiples of one figure in a case anymore. You have to make a case of eight unique figures. That way you know you're going to sell 100% of your product every time to the collector. And that's it. Well, I think if you fast forward to today... And you're a parent walking down a toy aisle in 2023. Vintage collection three and three quarter figures for Star Wars are $16.99 for the base figure. For your deluxe figures are $27.99. Um, but there's a whole slew of other things in that aisle from Transformers, um, which run at about eleven ninety nine a figure for their core series collection. Um, there's a lot less, there's less expensive things for kids to buy. So if you're a parent of a, a six year old kid, are you going to buy him a seventeen to almost thirty dollar action figure for him to play with? Are you going to buy him four? Are you going to buy him five? So we can have the whole collection. I think that Hasbro's pricing themselves out for Star Wars. I think they're pricing them out of the kid market. Which then again leads to what we said, the adult collector market. Plastic initiatives not authorized or endorsed by the Discord Limited. The name Star Wars and all related materials are registered trademarks of the Discord Limited, a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company, Black Lights Reserve. Galactic Initiative is registered trademark and other products and company names are trademarks of their respective holders. Use does not imply affiliation or endorsement.